What's up, fanboys and girls, and welcome to the Infinite Universe Podcast, episode 13. We are your host. I'm Jay Days. Alongside me, my cape companion, Ben. My mom's name isn't Martha Metlis. Your mom's name's Martha, too. <laughs> In today's show, we'll be discussing the latest DC Universe release, Wonder Woman 84, plus recap some of our favorite moments from season two of The Mandalorian. We'll also talk about which TV series and movies coming next year we are most excited about. Before we get into things, make sure to subscribe to our channel on YouTube and give us a like. We're also on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Rate and review all that good stuff. We're also out there on many other platforms. Just tell your Alexa to play the Infinite Universe podcast and here we go. All right, let's get into it, Ben. The long-awaited sequel to Wonder Woman dropped on Christmas Day to apparently a lot of mixed reviews. Now, for me, during my first watch, I found this to be very enjoyable. Did I love it? No. Did I think it was great? No. But I definitely liked it. And it wasn't until my second watching where I was a little bit more critical. But initially, I enjoyed it. But let me say this. I never really go into movies to be critical and just critique everything. I go in to be entertained and to enjoy myself. And the movie had action, it had comedic moments, and at times it had a good story. Um, There were definitely characters that I felt carried this movie, but generally, I think it was pretty decent. Ben, what do you think? I actually agree with you. I found the movie enjoyable. Now, I feel like the movie was fantastic for the first, like a third, uh, two thirds of the movie, but I feel that the ending kind of fell off, which goes into something we'll talk about, what Patty Jenkins said. Um, But I liked it. I I really loved the beginning. Uh, One thing that I was concerned about was um, how they were going to bring Chris Pine back, Steve. And I thought the explanation was very believable. I like the entire quantum leap kind of thing where she saw him one way, but other people saw him another way. That was interesting. Yeah. Um, Right from the get-go, we had that throwback scene, the flashback of... uh little diana yeah um you like that scene you said i thought it was cool cool? i like the entire concept that i thought it was supposed to be the theme of the entire movie that if you try to cheat yeah there was definitely a lot of foreshadowing in there that was definitely the setup of the movie um i did find one part pretty funny (laughs) i remember laughing out loud when uh she was racing on the horses and then the the tree slapped her in the face and she fell and then that's when she took shortcut. That was supposed to go into her hubris where she was so far ahead. She kind of looked back and like was trying to gauge where other people were. And instead of being focused on her own task, she fell off. And then she was given the opportunity to cheat. So it was kind of like her not being concentrating led to her trying to cheat because she was fell behind. Yeah, and that's kind of the whole setup for the movie. I didn't mind it. I kind of liked it. It kind of played with the original, um, the the first movie where they, you know, they go back to the uh, ancestry of the Amazonians and that whole history and where they're from. And it, you know, sets up who Wonder Woman is exactly, right? And then we go uh, where it kind of, kicks off in um 1984 i love the mall scene that was a great scene it was a lot of fun right it was a lot of fun they definitely put a bunch of 80s tropes in and i thought it was also a nice uh tribute to uh the old 19 late 1970s show yeah Uh, i thought that kind of like was like the action was over the top but not too over the top where it took you away from it it was fun well one thing i noticed about those action scenes and actually throughout the movie is that um you know, she's a very, this is a very kind of clean cut superhero, Mm -hmm. you know, like when she was kicking these guys ass, you know, she wasn't like breaking their neck. She wasn't breaking any bones or causing internal bleeding. Being aggressive. Yeah. She, you know, would handle business and then place them down. And I kind of noticed that actually right off the jump. I'm like, oh, she, this is the very, uh, by the books or clean cut, uh, Captain America type, but without the Captain America edge, you know? Yeah. Um, where I was like, it felt very wholesome, actually. And it was different. I noticed that right away. It just felt different in, in that tone. Well, I think that was, especially with the beginning was supposed to be, too, with the bright colors and the yeah. look. It was uh, like it was a lot of lighting. I think that whole scene was supposed to like symbolize that old 
19 late 1970s and early 1980s like comic book television action where like they weren't going to go over the top and show you people breaking bones they were going to do like all right the good guy kicks the bad guy's ass and then the bad guys have their comeuppance like you know and i think they purpose i think that was purposely done um, but to say the, uh, that they didn't go over the top with it is kind of funny though because didn't they kind of when the freaking bad guy takes the the small child and yeah, hangs yeah. it over the free first off why is he grabbing the child one there was another criminal like no one was necessarily like he could have just kind of like ran and tried to escape the in, immediate danger wasn't right there he kind of stopped what he was doing throws then, his bag yeah. down grabs the kid i'm like bro what are you doing and then he and then it seemed like his crime partner was trying to like talk him out of it like no man you don't gotta do it i'm like yo what is going yeah, on didn't that remind you of like the old flash television show and like those kind of shows okay, where yeah. like the bad guys are so like stupid almost yeah. where it's like why it just seems so out of place i yeah. was like why we, like it didn't make sense but it was kind of funny though, i, I think time. that was purposely done to kind of emulate and or uh, emulate the uh the old like kind of over the top 1980s like yeah. you know like yeah exactly where where would a bad guy dangle like a little girl over the side just run like, go to the he, exit <laughs> like how did that help him like yeah, get did, away? yeah exactly no. it actually made his situation worse, worse because he stayed right in front of wonder woman or but, how about like, this i didn't even know wonder woman's headband acted as a, a batarang no, that was cool how they had it. I had no idea. <laughs> was that either. something that was always a thing, or is that I new? don't think so. I don't. Th I think that was. Uh, she took lessons was... from uh, Captain Boomerang, maybe. <laughs> or maybe she was just trying to copy Captain America. She doesn't have a shield, so it's her. It's her uh, tiara. Yeah, her tiara so, is a weapon. Um. Yeah, and then we had those guys break. Uh. Obviously, they stole stuff from that jewelry store, and that's kind of the the setup for this. Uh. Was it the wishing stone or the dream stone? Dream stone, yeah. Dream stone, uh, where you would make a wish. So I guess moving from there, uh, you know, we get introduced to a bunch of characters in this movie. Some I actually really enjoyed, and some it just kind of really fell flat to me, honestly. Uh, you know, we're introduced to Minerva, and she's kind of this like geek, 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 bumbling idiot. But it's very just like. I don't know. It doesn't, it feels like so forced, you know? I don't know. I actually liked her character. I, I'll be honest. I liked her character other than the other person in it. I, I thought that. Oh, she wow. Was like, We're going to have a good uh, yeah, discussion I, then. Cause I, I have thought a that of Kristen Wiig played the, um, like, yeah, she's an arch type like geek, but also she, there was a comment where uh, Gal Gadot or like a uh, wonder woman, she, um, Diana says to her like you know she's like oh I wish I was more like you and she's like I wish I was more like you you're like outgoing bubbly like you know she was kind of they were opposites in every manner like yeah. Kristen Wiig's character was bubbly talkative like kind of funny when Gal Gadot's character was kind of like supposed to be in kept like she can't get over all that she's she's lived a long time and like the the um the experiences are weighing down on her yeah, I mean, to me, it just seemed very generic and didn't really have a lot of depth to, uh, I to thought, it. I thought you know, the she opposite. comes in, I she liked her. she spills her uh, bag right away. Like the other guy she works with ignores her. Well, play um, to the theme of the movie. Then, then. then, like you know, it was kind of so obvious. <laughs> and again, this is all my critiques going in the second time around because I noticed these things the second time. The first time, I was like you, I guess. Let me say this. I think it was also the fact that we really haven't had any of these movies all year long. Um, this was one we were waiting for for a while, and it dropped on Christmas Day. So there was a lot of excitement for, for me around mm -hmm. it. So going into it, you know, I kind of let a lot of this stuff pass. But going in watching it the second time, I was like, oh, oh, now she's making the comment of, oh, I like those shoes, you know, and they have the cheetah print on the shoes. Uh, I kind of like that foreshadowing. Like, okay, yeah. I like that foreshadowing. I thought that it was cool foreshadowing. To because me, it just seemed like, it was blatant. It was like, yeah, hey, was, but the we whole know movie she's gonna. Is blatant. Yeah. yeah well, the whole movie again, is I'm not trying to shit on it. I'm just no, saying, no. like, I wish they could have taken that depth of character a little bit further, um, because it was just to me, you know, like when they're sitting down, Diana and Minerva sitting down having their best friends all of a sudden after working for one day, and they're sitting down eating well, lunch. I think they were just kind of. Uh, Diana saw that she was lonely and didn't have any friends. And yeah. Was like you know what. Yeah, let's go out and like hang out. She also realized that she's lonely too. What was funny to me though about that scene is not even Minerva believed that Diana hasn't had a date in all this time. 
Girl's absolutely stunningly hot. You're gonna tell me all this time she's been lonely sitting I down. I think it's self aware you know? and plays on itself. Yeah. So, you know, that that's kind of like where I'm like, all right, they could have I don't know. You could have sold me on something a little bit better, but I wasn't mad at it. it I just, liked her. It, it didn't feel like clever writing. I to liked me. her character a lot more than the other guy. I had Pedro Pascal's uh, Maxwell wow. Lord. So here's this is so I interesting thought, because for me, he carried the freaking movie. No, for I me. thought I thought he was unnecessary. Actually, oh, geez. I think that if they kept Kristen Wiig as the main villain, and like, see, I thought he was too much of a stereotype of like elon musk meets bill gates he was too over the top i feel i don't know well I, it was told that he was supposed to be a representation of like a trump kind of figure I, I i didn't even think he was like trump i thought he was just like a douchey billionaire but like that Trump's is, a mega megalomaniac hello I mean, did you watch the same movie as me Pedro Pascal played a megalomaniac no i think he was just uh i i feel like he was just kind of stuck in debt see the whole debt no, thing to no, me no in the empty, yes, in the empty office it was a guy who hedged his bets too far he bought really bad oil fields and now he was kind of desperate to no, make his son a proud of him because why is he going to all these countries to try to overthrow and then well that was when he became the power of the dreamstone that right. was the previous to the dreamstone he was just a guy who was in desperate needs when he became the Dreamstone, to me... Well, the, he was a con artist, the, actually. Yes. Not a guy in desperate need. I think there's a difference. He was desperate because his con because was failing. Because his con was failing, yes. You know, so... And and why I think he was my favorite character in this, just... He, I think Pedro just kills it in every role that he's no, in. No, he was and, good as an actor, but I just thought the whole character was kind of too over the top. And, like, when he started going around just giving people wishes, like... There were certain wishes that me. didn't make sense. A hundred percent. There was some that were, like, very wishy-washy. I did kind of like how every time someone made a wish, you would see that faint little, like, a blowing of wind, the, blow. the hair. <laughs> yeah. So they, like, kind of hints like, ooh, spooky... I was like, oh, it's happening. And did you notice it the first time it happened? The guy randomly walked by and he goes, I wish for coffee. coffee yeah. And you saw, and I noticed that the first time, like, did something just happen? And then, like, the coffee came and you really didn't, like, you just, they actually played it off, like, oh, this is just coincidental until the next time I think someone wishes is, I think, Diana. And it happens again. Um, and then once Minerva makes the wish in the office, which is, I think, the third person. Uh, you see it again. So I'm like, oh, that's kind of cute. You know, they're a little, you know, ooh, spooky. <laughs> but um, so a lot of people had problems with the uh, Dreamstone itself. Well, and, and what was funny to me is that, like, you know, this always goes back to the argument. People have a problem over a make-believe thing in a make-believe yeah. movie. Yeah. And it's just like, where do you draw the line? Because, yeah, we can nitpick all of this stuff 100%, but it's all make-believe. So, like, why is one thing more believable than the other? Which brings me to a point. <laughs> I don't know if we should go into it right now, but uh, F it, let's just do it because I'll lose okay. track. Her flying in the air, soaring, catching the lightning. I don't know. Like okay. that was that was a little much. I didn't think it was necessary after they already introduced the invisible plane. Because Bingo. Wonder Woman was known for Invisible Plane. We got the Invisible Plane, and I kind of like how they did that. I it was also kind of like out of nowhere, like, oh, they have this ability? Oh, kind of makes sense. I'm with it. I Good enough for me. I think that the flying was supposed to be him teaching her something, him leaving her with something that's going to be everlasting for her. Okay, here's because my biggest beef with it, though. That the, it, yeah, you fly, yeah, and you yeah, yeah, catch yeah. The, yeah, the, yeah. the... I think that was the whole point of it. Yeah, I get it. No, here's my problem, though. This doesn't make any sense, and correct me if I'm wrong. She's flying to go get the bad guy who's somewhere far away. I forget where he is, right? Wherever. It doesn't matter. He's flying a long distance. I think he's in Egypt. Okay, exactly. I think yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. He's in Egypt. Not even the same continent, mind you. No, no, no. She's flying toward him. Then we see a scene where she goes home. So in mid-travel, she goes home to grab the wings and then goes back out? Come on. Uh, At yes. that point, why wouldn't it would be faster for her to take an actual jet Do or the invisible the jet invisible. Well, than to fly? How fly? How far? Is, how fast is she flying? Is right? She, yeah. <laughs> and here we go. Just that goes down to all right. So we're gonna believe everything else in I this think, movie and then have problem I with think that her the flying. flying. Was unnecessary. It was redundant after you inv in in introduce the invisible jet because the invisible jet is a trope of Wonder Woman. Uh, which like remember the family guy where he's like oh are you in the invisible jet and she's like i'm actually in the invisible bathroom and he's like <laughs> he's like oh 
noticed you didn't wash your hands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, with Kristen Wiig's character, I did like how they uh, developed her abilities in the beginning. Mm -hmm. They start to manifest. Um, some of the qu you know very quick things you realize is. At first, she couldn't walk in heels. Now, all of a sudden, she's walking great in heels. The guy spills the mop bucket. She jumps up like a cat and has, like, she's, great agility. She's very confident. And then she starts having, yeah, she's confident, and people start showing her attention. And then she starts to realize her strength and stuff. So it was a cool development there. And then you could even see her um, personality start to shift, you know, and she becomes a little bit more, like, just kind of ruthless as well, the story goes her on. her empathy it starts disappearing. And I think that was like the whole thing with also uh, the other guy with Maxwell Lord was that it, the whole point of the movie is absolute power uh, corrupts absolutely. When you can wish for anything you want, you have absolute power. Kristen Wiig's character got her wish. She became very confident. She became the person she always wanted to be, but it was at the sacrifice of the person she was. So remember when she gives the food after her lunch yeah, with Diana to the, to the homeless, guy? homeless guy? And they established that she had a relationship with him. And I think that the ending should have been Diana trying to convince her to renounce her wish where Diana was able to renounce her wish by giving up, you know, Trevor, uh, Steve Trevor, but Kristen Wiig's character wasn't able to renounce her wish because she finally became the person she wanted to be, but she was unable to see that the person she was was already good person. And that's why her struggle was overshadowed by the struggle of Maxwell Lord. And I feel like, like maybe if they put the homeless guy in danger, she purposely put the homeless guy in danger. And that made her realize that like, Oh God, I'm yeah. Who have I become? That would have been a, better not a bad suggestion. And the last we see of her, she's just kind of laying on like the cliff and like the sun is rising or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So, and was she morphing back into a human? I think, cause she wasn't I, as, I don't think she was in the form I don't of know. cheetah. I think I maybe forget. also she refused to renounce her wish at the end. Okay. Interesting. Maybe. Um, Which can I also make a comment? I felt that the tre cheetah form or transformation was kind of forced. I felt like, Oh, well we need to make her into like, like, like you said, Animorphs. Yeah. Like we need to make this like cats like movie. Well, like, people you know? said like, yeah, they the it looked like cats, and yeah, then yeah. and then the people online were saying, oh, wasn't it funny how is a cat chasing a bird at the end? I I felt <laughs> that the end of them like remember the fight scene between them and the White House. Yeah, that, that was, was a so way much better, a better scene. scene yes. than, like, and know, actually, yeah. that's what I was gonna let me let me go to the final scene between Cheetah and uh, Wonder Woman. And I know we're jumping around a bunch, but um, yeah, but. That fight scene at the end, it kind of, every time I was like, where's the big, like, boom, where's the big smack into the wall? Like, it didn't feel like big enough, you know, it kind of felt very flat where my favorite scene in probably the movie was the White House scene, because that was like some of the coolest action that, that we awesome saw, action film, you know, from, from yeah. everyone involved, yeah. um, from Pedro trying to, trying to escape, from Maxwell Lord trying to escape. You know, the, the chase. Um, Cheetah, like, trying to protect him. Um, those other armed guards that were the, the president's White guards. House, the White the Secret House Service. Secret Service trying to kill them both. Yeah. Or shoot them both. And, like, and her actually getting injured because her wish kind of was weakening her. And I like that, too. No. So, I think it was as Cheetah's wish, as her power got better, bigger it and stronger. Draining. It was draining Diana's oh, Wonder Woman. Because, okay. Yeah. And if you notice, as Cheetah got stronger, Diana got weaker throughout See, the movie. they could have played into that more. And I felt like that wasn't explained more. They tried to focus too much on this Maxwell Lord character, who I thought was like, I don't know. They, like, the whole third act to me felt forced. Like, first off, to going back to the Cheetah scene where they're fighting in the transformation, what was the whole point of the gold outfit? Because Cheetah just ended up destroying the wings anyway. It was basically to protect her from damage as much as possible. Yeah, but she ended up just in defensive mode and Cheetah just destroyed it. Yeah, she but if like, she didn't oh, have that, she'd have been effed up even more. No, she prior. was beating her up after anyway. Like, it was just like right after the wings were destroyed, she did that iconic, like, that's been in all the trailer scenes where she shrugs off the wings and then goes and kicks Cheetah's butt. So why didn't you just go and kick Cheetah's butt to begin with? Why were you letting her actively attack your wings? Like... I felt like that was just, and then the adding in the nuclear war, the riots, like they tried to add too much action. Well, that's, movie let's be honest. Stereotype. That's DC's problem yeah. through and through is that they always try to go a little bit too much. 
Um, I didn't mind it, but I do see what you're saying where it just seems like, you know, there's a lot going on. And there, what happens is there's a lot going on that doesn't lead anywhere. anywhere. So right. it's kind of like, oh, this is a cool setup. Where's it going to go? And it kind of goes nowhere. Yeah. And there's a bunch of those little moments. But I don't know, the whole him having to have the other person make the wish and then the turn is is that he'll take something from you because now that he's the dreamstone there was a, the 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 latin on it said that you'll get your wish but with some sort of twist like a monkey's paw yeah but i feel like that was poorly constructed though because like we said before some of the wishes didn't make sense and like it was what, like and then, like like the whole thing with getting the guards from the oil guy like just to get revenge and then like you vote and then him going to the president that to me was just like, why, why you want the power of the president, but you don't want to be president. Like, I don't know. I felt like some of the stuff and then the people trying to ransack his office didn't kind of, well, he wanted power. That. He wanted influence, you know, and, and he went to the high. So where did he go? He went to the guy who had more oil than him. Grab that. Then he no, went, but then he found out the guy didn't have any oil. Yeah. Well, like, so then, uh, yeah. So then he went to the next, cause he's a con artist. He kept going to the next con the next I don't hustle i think it was the con artist. i think he was just power hungry becoming the dreamstone made him obsessed with gaining power and then that television scene at the end where he just starts getting the radios and like why was that wind able to push diane away what was that wind that was keeping her away from actually like getting to him like why was he in that like star wars type like you know blue yeah, light yeah. tube like what the hell was that like i don't know it didn't make sense to me well, all right, let me tell you the parts now that I did actually enjoy. Um, you know, I did actually really like Maxwell Lord. Um, Pedro Pascal, I think, did awesome. I think there was a lot more depth in his character than there was, frankly, in, in Wonder Woman's. Uh, Wonder Woman's um... fell flat, most of it. Um, and another character, so for me, it was Pedro and it was um, Chris Pine. Uh, oh, he was great. Steve Trevor was so good in, good this. in this. It was like, funny. Uh, you know, there was the um the, when he, you know, first comes back and she's walking and he's on the escalator and he doesn't he has no idea what's going on. He's like kind of yeah. like lunging and like you know, and then he sees like the punk rockers and they have like the, the hair and he or sees the, the break dancers. The uh the the change in uh the change in clothing. Yeah. And like he kept having the fanny pack well, on. Well it was funny when they walk across the break dancers and the guy starts to move and he actually goes to defend Diana. And she's like, no, 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 no. Yeah. it's fine. Yeah, it was funny. So, or the street art. And then he goes, what is this? And she goes, a garbage can. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, and he had a bunch of other just like kind of like really charming moments throughout it. It was interesting though. Like, what did you think of that angle that they used to, to bring him back? I thought it was great. Yeah. I thought that it was, uh, it was a fantastic, um, like I said, the quantum leap type, uh, type, where, like a lot of people had beef with it. No, I didn't, I thought I didn't it was mind very, it. I thought it was very well done. It actually kind of elaborated more on Wonder Woman 1. Like, you know, I thought that it did their relationship more justice and brought her closure. Well, also, some of the beef people had with online was that, you know, it's been like a couple decades since they saw each other. And this girl's been, you know, no pun intended, pining over Chris Pine, <laughs> Steve Trevor for all this time. And um, they only really knew each other for a couple days in the other but one. But remember, that's the first man she ever met. Yeah, that's true. In the oh, first movie, point. that's Very the first point. man she ever met. She's never seen a man before that. That's a fair argument that I haven't heard before, actually. And I think that that's why. Like, you know, it's the kind of... He left an everlasting imprint. And then also, it's only been about, what, 30 years for her since the first movie? She's been alive for, what, a couple thousand? Like, you know, so that's like... A couple of weeks, <laughs> like she's really been only in our time, like kind of like stuck on him for a couple months, maybe. I hate to take a dark turn down this road, but now uh, Steve Trevor really wasn't there. It was just she thought he was there in this other guy's body. It was someone else physically the whole time. Yeah, but it was his personality. All right. It's him, it's him because but remember he said... They definitely ended up sleeping together at some point. Well, that's why at the end, he she saw the guy... I know, but was... you're skipping past what I'm getting at here. 
Yeah, she slept with technically a different guy. Yeah, on. Unw- I mean, I'm. I don't know if he'd be willing or not. I'm sure he would probably be willing. Are you trying to bring he's in the, like technically she raped Te- him? I mean, hey, yeah. you said <laughs> it. I serious? didn't. Are you said really? it. I didn't. Like, uh, there, hey, I'm not the only one who thought this. And uh, as I'm watching the movie, I'm like, but wait, I is that? Oh, I think that is what I think happened. Okay. All right. I guess if you want to get into semantics, but then also again, we need this to is pull- all make believe, by the yeah, way. We so we don't have to, you know. But then I thought that they. Even if that can be insinuated or argued about, at the end, they did kind of have a nice interaction because he said to her, you know, I need you. You need to go and find someone else. And she goes, I can't. And he goes, what about the guy that I'm in his body? Like, he's not a bad looking guy. And that was when I think she looked at him and was like, oh, maybe I can like, you know, I've, and maybe in her own mind, she's like, I technically did sleep with him. Well, did she, they should have exchanged numbers at the end or something. Well, I think that like talk about being too obvious. Maybe like maybe it's their fate to re meet again. I don't know. If we see another Steve Trevor and a third one, I don't know if people are gonna buy it. No, no. They 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 brought him back in a very in my opinion, and I know people are upset about it, but in my opinion, it really worked. Yeah, I didn't mind it. It really I, worked. I mean I thought, but Well, here's the thing, they could have really done anything to bring him back. It was just one of many options that I, I think it was okay. I don't know how you would bring someone back from the dead and, and no, have no. it be okay. You, you know? can't bring him back in the third so, one because I think in the third one it would have been like, uh, it would be too obvious. Yeah. But honestly, the whole Wonder Woman uh, act was, it was kind of fell flat to me. Like, there's never moments where I really feel like Diana's in danger. Um, there's never no. really moments where I feel like, I'm feeling really bad for the character. You know, there's no like, th- what does she have to overcome? I don't know. I kind of felt bad for her about her loneliness. Um, I, I know thought she's that a mega whole, babe. I think the whole thing with uh, with her and Steve was like, you know, where she didn't want to give him up. I thought that was really well portrayed. Listen, she's a beautiful woman. She's obviously doing well. She works at a nice museum, has a great apartment. <laughs> I don't see. I mean, she knows why Bruce she's so Wayne. lonely. Yeah. Well, well, no, this is before Bruce Wayne. I mean, Remember, there's 84. He, we've all been through heartbreak. And, like, you know, there's a difference between breaking up with someone yeah, who's still alive. Sometimes you got to get over like, it. And, I don't know, a couple decades should probably do well, it. Well, like I said, she's a thousand years old. So those couple decades to her is really only a couple months. Uh, I'll, I'll end it with this. I enjoyed it a lot more than I did Wonder Woman 1. I will say that. I liked them equally. Okay. Um, for me, it just felt more fun. Uh I, get, I think people complain that this was a little too long, which is always a funny really? like, which is always a funny response to me because I'm like, I don't want an hour and a half like version of anything. Like, give me two hours, two hours plus of something. If I'm going to sit down and watch something I've been waiting a year or two years for, like, I don't want it to be crap, but at the same time, like, you know, give me a little bit more than a, a sequel that's an hour and a half. So people are like, ah, it's too long. Wouldn't you rather it be a little bit longer than to be I think that the short? fact to to make a comment on it's too long means that you're just paying attention to the time. And if you're not I'm really watch- trying to enjoy it yeah, anyway, right? If I'm watching an hour of a show of a movie and it feels like it's only been about 20, 20 minutes or a half an hour, then that's fine. But I've watched slow burn movies that went by really quick and I've watched fast like action movies that feel like, oh my God, when are you going to get to a point? Like, you know... And this, I thought, paced very well. I thought it paced very, very well. I I liked it. I thought that the third act was very kind of, I felt like it was definitely a Warner Brothers third act. It was not a Patty <laughs> Jenkins third act. And she's even said that they made her change the ending. Really? I didn't so, know that. Yeah, yeah I was introduced- actually a little, um, one of the things that I was, in, I was, I noticed, I was like, for me, both Cheetah and Wonder Woman didn't even feel like, I don't know the focal point of this movie so no, much for I me. No, I said I felt like Maxwell Where, Lord was and, too and, much the focal point. Yeah, and yeah. and for it to be a Patty Jenkins, you know, vehicle and to be Wonder Woman and all of that, you would think that the female leads would have, you know, more of that development, more of that um you, you walk away and you feel like wow, those two characters were amazing and both of them just kind of felt like eh I, I disagree on how you feel about Kristen Wiig's character, but I do think that the one comic book fe- scene in the film was that White House fight. To me, that was like straight off of the uh, pages of a comic book. Yeah, that was definitely one of I the best I thought it was scenes. well choreographed, like you said, and 
I don't know. I, I liked it. Would I watch it again? Eh, if it's on TV and like, you know, maybe if I'm going through decide it's a movie I'd watch again. Now let's talk about this. So this was the first kind of big blockbuster to be released yeah. as streaming. Um, well, at the same time, it came out in, in theaters. They did um, it. Uh, dual, dual release. They did a dual um, release. I don't know what the box office sales were for this. So uh, they said that Wonder Woman 1984 was successful. Now, they haven't released the streaming um, numbers for uh, HBO Max, but I have heard reports that they are happy with the numbers on that. One thing that I did notice, and, and I was trying to like rattle around in my head, I'm like... I think this story would have been better told as a series, multiple episodes. Um, and and I also, I'm kind of like, yo, is our series the way to go for the future? Because with these series, as you've seen with The Mandalorian, which we're going to get into next, have a big conversation about that. Um, they could tell these stories so much better. You, you, you can never get a Star Wars story as good as that second season as Mandalorian in a, in a two hour movie. What about Rogue One? I feel like I don't Rogue One. N- not as good as Mandalorian think, season two. Uh, Rogue One to me is still, uh, I, I think they're, I think they're on par. Wasn't people's reactions to the TV series, uh, a lot better than the reactions to a lot of the recent movies. Oh, absolutely. That we've had. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I say, you know, because Marvel's doing a bunch of this now, where they're taking a lot of their main characters and putting them into, you know, these TV series that are also going to tie into the movies, and you're going to have to watch both to understand what's going on. Uh, I think DC needs to do that. And again, like some of these storylines could be told a lot better with, you know, a ten episode series. I think. But let me also pose this for you though because dc picks actors and actresses well actors in general sorry who aren't likely to do like i can't see gal gadot doing a 10 10 episode tv series on wonder woman why not though everything's changing though because uh, well now it's changing but when they first signed them up like you know i don't think that they try to go too big where the actor is bigger than the part i think that's an old way of of hollywood though um a lot of uh, I think you see a lot more big actors signing on for these TV roles well, more and more. HBO, yeah, Netflix. You know, people are big name actors are, are you know the highlight of some of these um, biggest series on these platforms now. Okay, so uh, I, I think I see a path though. Why I say that though, it was so nice to be sitting with family on Christmas. You know, you just had a nice dinner. We had a bunch of snacks and food, and and uh, you had some drinks going, and you get to watch a movie comfortably in your couch. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Oh, it was nice it, last night watching it, Wonder Woman. It was really nice to have that opportunity, and, and you know, what did it cost? Fourteen ninety nine. Not a big deal. You know, if everyone that was there uh, watched it, you know, obviously it would have been over a hundred dollar night. You know, at a movie theater. Um, Even more with food and yeah, candy and stuff, which is something that. You know, I'm thinking that's their biggest, you know, money rules the world. So that's their biggest concern is, you know, are they going to be losing out on more money by bringing stuff to platforms like HBO Max or Netflix um, or just keeping them in theaters? I mean, piracy is huge, you know, think that it will make them lose money because there's a lot of a lot of production companies after Warner Brothers made the announcement uh like really fighting Warner Brothers. So Dune was announced that they're know, not yeah. going to put that on the platform. A couple other movies too. So I don't know. This it's is a gonna... double-edged sword because you know, uh, you feel for the people who work on these movies. Um yeah. But at the same time, it's also like these greedy movie companies that make a big cut of this movie and you know, the people who work on it necessarily don't see a lot of that money um i don't know kind of getting the weeds there but i think series and platform streaming even if it's just movies uh is going to be you know the future uh theaters we could see them you know dwindling away yes there will still be a few movies that go into theaters but it just it seems like this is the path maybe i mean i think we're right now at a iffy time well like like the whole idea that Warner Brothers uh, does not, I mean, HBO Max does not want to release their streaming numbers and Disney the same thing with their newest release. I think that says a lot about how protective they are about their future moves. And they'll decide that based upon like, you know, what movies 
that they do release how many viewers they have and how much of an increase of subscribers. And yeah. that will decide on that. One of the things I do like, this fun little option that we, I don't know if it's always been there, but it seems like uh, it's happening a little bit more and more now. The opportunity to rent out a theater for like 200 bucks. Oh, that's awesome. I heard about with, that. So you just rent it out during a certain time. You know, you yeah. reserve it and you could bring your friends. And that's kind of cool too, you know, for the people who still love going to the theater. I saw a bunch of guys who rented out a theater and they set up their... Um, their Nintendo DS oh, and nice. they were playing Smash Brothers. Very cool. These guys were playing Smash Brothers on like a movie theater screen. I was like, that is all, that's a great idea. That's sick. Like, and if you have 10 guys and, or 10 people and they all put in 20 bucks or so, or like, you know, that'd be fun. All right, let's switch gears here. We're going to go into what an epic ride the freaking final episodes of The Mandalorian were mm -hmm. this year. Uh, season two for me was probably some of my favorite uh, Star Wars anything ever, honestly. Um, it's at the top of the list for me, particularly the last four episodes of The Mandalorian were amazing. Uh, just the whole series, the story kind of, you know, really took its next leaps and jumps. Starting with episode six, when we we're introduced to Bo-Katan and her crew, and uh, she saves Mando from those like squid pirates you remember the that Calamari, scene? The Mon Calamari. <laughs> They're called the Calamari. That's uh, funny. I know that the fish guys are called Mon Calamari. I don't know if the squid, um, from what I've read, the fish guys and the squid looking guys, they're kind of the same species, but like they look differently based upon where they came up. Yeah. So I think that the people are called Mon Calamari. Well, from that episode on, it just got just amazing and more incredible each episode so it went from what bo to ahsoka to boba fett oh yeah to those two last episodes where it was just to uh, such a great the ride. death troopers and to, incredible uh, and so the big I mean, spoilers so the big spoiler let's talk about you know what was your reaction you know before we get into the big spoilers at the end uh of the whole seasons leading up to that last episode well i agree with you that to me, this entire season felt more like Star Wars than any of the last three movies combined. Mm -hmm. Like, that actually felt like Star Wars. How I felt when I originally watched The New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi. It's full of, like, wonder, excitement, like, curiosity, I mean, all that. Yeah. So Nothing, and, nothing was um, uh, expected either, I don't think. At least no. for me. It, it was very like, ooh, this is cool. Or there was a lot of new things we saw, too, yes. in this Star Wars universe that we never saw before. Or they paid tribute to old Star Wars stuff but expanded on it. Yeah. Like, what um, was that meme of the J.J. Abrams and Jon Favreau thing? J.J.'s like line about, um, we can never satisfy uh, original fans while appealing to a new audience. You can never uh, satisfy fan service when trying to get a new audience. And, and, uh, John and then Favre John Favreau was like, hold, hold my, my beer. coffee. Or hold, hold my beer. Yeah, whatever it was. Yeah, uh, yeah no. Favreau knocked it out the park uh, with all of his choices, I think. Um, such a fun ride throughout. No, he definitely knew how to pay service to the old fans. And I think the best thing about this season was... The it touched upon so much of the other Star Wars stuff, like it brought in Rebels characters, Clone Wars, tried webbing in other like planets. newer lore, newer lore planets, but also paying service to the expanded universe. Like, um, the first episode when Mando walks into the fight scene and that guy Gore Koresh, who is actually played by John Leguizamo, I had no idea. <laughs> well, yeah, I had no idea either. He's actually in the aftermath novels, uh, so. That it it kind of they did their research with this season and they knew how to add a lot of old characters, new characters without making it oversaturated. Even though there are people who are saying it's oversaturated, but like you know, nah, I, I'm I'm, gonna I'm on board. I'm enjoying yeah. it. Uh, all right, what did you want to uh, talk on? So I I loved uh, I loved Bo Katan. And the idea of her bringing in the Mandalorian different credences. Yeah. Uh, so there was a lot of um, backlash in season one when he refused to take the helmet off. And it kind of went into that why certain Mandalorians could take their helmet off and certain Mandalorians can't. Um, they I, finally... didn't, I didn't know that, actually. Uh, it was kind of cool to see when bo was introduced. Her and her crew kind of like laughed at him like, oh, you're one of those. Like... You're like, oh, You're there's different. Yeah, there's yeah, different. Yeah. So he's kind of, I don't want to say the, they're the normal ones. I don't, you know, want to say quote, you know, but like 
his section of Mandalorians are a very kind of like niche group. Am I correct? Well, no, it's a very, uh, very strict followers of a specific code. But I think also for Bo-Katan, she used to be a member of Death Watch, which actually kind of broke off from the Watchers. Uh, so she sees it as, oh, I used to kind of be like you, where I was a part of that fanatical mindset. And it cost me her, it cost her her sister in the, in the Clone Wars uh, episode. So... Well, what's interesting about that is we kind of see Mando's, uh, he's kind of like letting go of that a little bit each season that goes by. So I wonder if eventually, season three, season four, we might see him rocking without a helmet a lot more. We It also has to do with like how season three will even start because it left at a specific cliffhanger where you're not sure where the relationship is between him and Bo-Katan. Nice. What else you got? So um, also... It's funny you mentioned the last four episodes. Um, I actually liked the second to last episode, the one with Bill Burr, better than I even liked the Sokotano one. Okay. And Bill Burr I've been waiting for Sokotano to be on live action for like ever. But I thought that that was fantastic. I just thought each episode just got it better, better, and better and better. And then even like the Bill Burr one, um, it was just so funny that they had like some of his comedic personality in there yeah uh there was a couple really cool scenes like that um cafeteria scene well you know that also ties in with battlefront 2 game because when the guy mentions operation cinder that was the main plot point of the battle to, uh, oh shit battlefront i didn't know 2, that where after the emperor died he sent out emissaries these robotic emissaries with the recording from him and the emperor's last or final order was supposed to be if he died the empire should not last so they basically sent satellites out to key key planets and the satellite shot lasers into the planet that messed up the entire uh, weather and created actually hurricanes that destroyed the planets. And that's where Bill Burr's character, because he was a stormtrooper, he saw what his own people were doing to him. Ah. And that was actually also a point in Battlefront 2 where one of the main characters in the game, her father was a general or I, I think even a moth. Uh, who was responsible for enacting. Operation so again, this Center. goes back to what you said is that this series is actually tying in different parts of the Star Wars lore. So you mentioned a book or a novel earlier. Aftermath. And now you're talking about a video game. The video game. Yeah. So that's kind of cool that they're yeah. taking all these different elements. And like some of that I didn't watch or play. So it was over my head. But now as you say it, I'm like, oh, that's really dope. Because throughout this, you know, there are moments that I recognize that maybe if you're not as big of a fan as maybe I am, which clearly I'm not as big of a fan as you are, but <laughs> it's just funny that you pick up on all these things and it's yeah. just like the depth of how awesome this series is can go really, really deep how familiar you are with the uh, source material. So let's take a step back actually to a couple episodes on episode four. Uh, the Siege with Carl Weathers and Cara Dune played by yeah. Gina Carano, where Carl Weathers like asks uh, Din to help him destroy an Imperial base. Now we learn that it's not just a normal Imperial base. They've actually been doing experiments. We're introduced to Dr. Pershing at that point, who actually we've seen in season in one. Season one, yeah, yeah. Yes. The guy with the glasses, right? Yes, kind of exactly. nerdy doctor dude. Yes, nerdy doctor dude. So we see tanks with figures in them, which we're not sure what's in there. And they also mention in Dr. Pershing's contact to the base something about m counts and the child's m count yeah i remember that so that brings up a whole bunch of theories on metal chlorine count what are the tanks is that snoke in there is that something else are they cloning someone else in there uh that we're going to see in future installments i mean it, it brings up some good kind of it leaves questions open so we kind of can theorize ourselves like wow where is this going to lead to nice nice you know, that's a really cool thought. Um, it just, yeah, it sets up a lot of what ifs for the future. Yeah, what ifs this. for the future. Yeah. And I guess it's also their try attempt to tie in the sequel movies. Yeah, and like, the spinoffs. You know, and the spinoffs. You know, because uh, a lot of another, like, what if is we're introduced uh, to Boba Fett. 
yeah. Ness as well. Which I feel like people have been waiting decades for. And that. how awesome was that episode, though? He was such a badass, right? Dude, when he puts on the the, the uh, finally puts on the um, armor, yeah, and like, and you see him like just kind of, and then the I kind of like before that when he was rocking like the hood and he had like the staff. I think he had like the staff and he was kicking ass and flipping people. And... You know what it reminded me of when he was beating up everyone? He was reminded me of Assassin's school. Creed a little bit. Oh, uh, reminded me of in Spider Man uh, Far From Home. When uh, Iron Man says to Spider Man, "If you can't, if you are nothing without the suit, you're not. You don't deserve it." Oh yeah, and it nice. was like almost like Boba Fett didn't need the suit. Yeah, no, he was. I didn't yeah, know he, he was that badass. Yeah, exactly. I thought he needed the rocket. I thought he needed no. the the gun and the the little scope on the helmet to be badass. Now he was a freaking beast. Um, and that was just such a fun episode. And then he gets the armor. Uh. And then it's just kind of like that full circle moment in the whole Star Wars lore that fans have been waiting for, for or theorizing for even yeah. for decades. So that what was really happened cool. What happened to him and then to go on, I also loved Slave One. We finally got Slave One in there. Yep. And to me, that was always my favorite ship. Uh, I liked it even better than the Millennium Falcon. Also, to go back to the part with Bo-Katan, their argument like going back to Clone War stuff where you know that oh, he's yeah. a clone and she goes and he said something about his father yep. and she goes, Don't you mean your donor? And then Sasha Banks' character goes, I know the voice of that cl- of a clone anywhere. Like, you know. Yeah, that was really cool. I like that. That was a good reference to episode two. Yes. Yeah. In nice. the Bill Burr scene where they're trying to decide who's gonna go into the P- Imperial Fortress and he goes Oh, they'll recognize my, let's just say they'll recognize me. Yeah. Like my face is one they'll recognize. Yeah. And then finally we get to the season finale, right? That was just so freaking incredible. I mean, just from the start, man, what an exciting episode. Uh, you know, there's definitely so many moments that just make it so much fun. Um, but what you said about the dark troopers, what were they yeah. called? Yeah, dark troopers. Oh man, how awesome were they? Well, I knew they weren't gone once they opened up the bay and they flew. That around. was so yeah. sick. First off, like just seeing Mando have to fight the first one by himself and struggle and barely make it out. You know what I mean? And then uh, for the other ones to try to escape. And then, you know, they shoot him out the, the They're like the kind ship. of like Terminator style trying yeah. to pull the doors open. And, and like, then they like release the, I guess that was the cargo bay and they, and they, they release the doors and then they go flying out. But I knew the same thing. I'm like, no, and that's, that's too easy of a, of a out for them. But then to see them come back and all those like heroes trapped in that room facing down with their guns and basically imminent death is upon them or, or let's just backtrack them trying to reach that room was so badass when they're fu- when they're fighting all the uh, stormtroopers when the one chick has her, her gun is stuck and she's in the elevator to fix it you know? and like, yeah and then she brings it up she's like duck and then shoots uh just so so fun and then um what's the moth dude's name moth gideon moth gideon dude uh one attention to detail I really enjoyed in the fight scene between him and Din with the uh, Dark Saber was: Did you notice that the Beskar staff he had, when the Dark Saber was too was on it for a long period of time, it started getting heat yeah. hot? So it's like Beskar can fight a lightsaber, but it's not perfect against it. It won't withstand the pressure after a long period of time. One of my favorite scenes with him though was when he was captured and he was about to try to commit suicide. And they're because like, he realizes who's yeah. coming. Well, it, it was that, but also he knew that he was F. He knew yeah, that yeah. there was no way out at that point. No, the new um, Republic was going to get him. And, 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 and if, and if he, you know, like he was done. So he was trying to take the easy way out and they were like, nah. And then they hit the, uh, the gun out of his hand. Um, but then we have all the dark troopers banging on the door and, um, you know, all of a sudden, one you, X-wing well, comes. That was the, that was funny. They're like, "Oh, we got one X-wing." Oh. She goes, "Gina Carano goes, oh great, one X-wing, we're saved." Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, like, and and for me, I didn't know who it was at first. I was hoping, I I knew it was a Jedi. I thought it was a Jedi because listen, a, a regular rebel uh, is not going to no. do much. So I knew it had to be like you know. Remember, we go back to a couple episodes before Baby Yoda or. Gogu at this point was uh, messaging someone. He was trying to at that Jedi temple. Temple, I think, yeah. and obviously that was our you know and spoiler alert coming. Stone. Um, but just uh, that scene when the X wing lands and then you see the hooded figure, Come and out. then I saw the green lightsaber. But still, even at that moment, I wasn't a hundred percent sure because I was like, I don't know what they're doing with this. But 
What was so cool is that they left it, though, until, like, that very last moment. So in the meanwhile, you just see this awesome hooded Jedi destroying these fools. And the part where he, like, lifts one and then crushes it. Do you know that's also a, uh, to go back into Star Wars lore, that's a banned move by the old Jedi Order. Ah. And people were commenting that that means that Luke maybe is more open to practices that the old Jedi's, like, you know, Mace Windu and Yoda kind of shied away so from. it was cool seeing His him you know crushes. like like you know hit him with a lightsaber and do a lot of good you know yeah. martial arts tactics and then you know using the force but seeing them get crushed that was kind of cooler to me than the, the vader death choke well it was effortless it didn't even look like he was trying like he came out and like we saw how hard it was for mando just to destroy one and luke skywalker came out and destroyed 12 yeah with well, nothing well we, spoiler alert, the Jedi ended up being Luke Skywalker. Oh. But how dope is that scene, though, where... So when they're sitting there in that room and they're all behind that door and then Grogu goes up to the computer and kind of is like communicating through the cameras. He's trying to show and, them that he's friendly with And him. then they open the door and then boom, you see the hood unveil. And it's a de-aged Mark Hamill, Luke Skywalker. I was like, this is awesome. Yeah. They killed it with that season finale. Like that whole lead up to that moment... And to have such a familiar, or if not the most like the most iconic Jedi there is, uh, to be the yeah. hero and to bring him back in that way, and then in my head, I'm not, again, I'm like, oh shit! So now I'm doing timelines. I'm like, oh, so this is after Return of the Jedi, and that's why he's still young. It's five years and after Return. Yeah, of the Jedi. so I'm like, oh, sick, and I'm like, oh, but now I just want a whole like series with a young Luke Skywalker. Now you know what I mean? Like if they want to do a whole eight episodes de aging Mark Hamill. And his voice, by the way, I'm pretty sure that was his voice think, that they uh, no, he definitely pitched did down the or voice. whatever, yeah. you know? They, uh, I think that, because we talked about in the last episode that they were ta there were rumors Sebastian Stan was going oh, to. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because I think that they kept it close enough to how he would look, but made it also almost look like Sebastian Stan. I can see that. I feel like they left themselves an option open that if they needed to add him again, they can get a life action hero and a person in there instead of just always de-aging Mark Hamill. I just, it, the whole season finale episode was just a masterpiece from front to back. Like never was I bored. Um, each moment felt more exciting than the next. And then the payoff at the end for me out of a season finale of anything that I've ever watched goes up there in like my top three of a series. Well, you're also missing the end credit scenes too. Well, before we get into that, I just want to say one thing. So what happened? So Gogu leaves with Luke. Luke yes. is going to go train him. But now is that the last we see of Gogu? No. So people have estimated during the events of episodes seven through nine, Grogu would be what? 75. So 78 or 79. So people are saying, well, does that mean Ben Solo killed Grogu? But Grogu at that time, he would most likely either be a Padawan or a young Jedi, maybe even in his trials. No, he's he would... already a hundred something years old. Uh... No, he's 50 in the show. Oh, okay. So, so in, in episode seven through nine, he would be in his late seventies, early eighties, which means he would probably be a teenager. Well, that's the thing. It's time. just basically, he didn't need to be there when Ben was killing the, he, there's a possibility he wasn't there. Yeah. He was probably in his trials. Well, so now I know that we're getting some of these spinoff series, and I think we're getting an R2-D2 series, right? <laughs> I don't know. Or, or there's something going on, and I'm wondering if we're going to see this like spinoff with R2-D2 and Grogu at like the Jedi training I temple. think actually we're not going to see Grogu until a future movie. Okay. What I think is going to happen is because remember, they hinted throughout the whole show that Grogu had a lot of fear. And him. I mean, this guy survived Order 66. He also, if you think about it in episode 7 through 9, he survived the murder of another Jedi temple. That So he survived the murders of two Jedi temples that he was training in. How does that not push him to the dark side? And I think we'll maybe see him, which I'm maybe I'm just hoping, I would like to see like a Dark Yoda almost type, where Ooh. he turns to the dark side, That'd be badass. he becomes a Sith. That could be trouble. And maybe a Jedi teams up with a Mandalorian to bring him back because a Mandalorian would remind him of the father he once had. Maybe Ahsoka. Ahsoka would be dead by then. Ahsoka's dead in like by the time, like, because she has to be. She's already in her for late 40s. And so she would be in her 70s by the time. I'm talking about like 200 years in the future. Oh, okay. Like where he's like maybe 220 years old, 250. He's what if aged. Ahsoka's species doesn't age like everyone else though? No, she does because she's well, she's grown up. Yeah. yeah, she's grown up. Yeah, 
I don't know. Stop trying to make sense of make believe stuff. Ben. Sorry. Uh, Actually, that goes back to also what when people are because Star Wars fans are funny. So people are trying to generally make sense of continuity. And I think it's funny that like I think it's come to terms we can't make sense with continuity. You either enjoy it or you don't. Yeah. Star Trek fans have accepted this for years because none of their continuity makes sense. Ask any Star Trek fan. So I think as Star Star Wars fans, we need to kind of just, you know, it's cool. I like it. Maybe just it doesn't make it, sense yeah. with the other stuff, but yeah. So now where does that leave us with Mando now? So So that goes into what we discussed at Mando tried to give the dark saber to both she wouldn't again. take it she wouldn't because take it. she needs to win it in battle but the only way to win it in battle is to kill the person no you have to disarm holding, the right? person okay you have to disarm them they have to which mando didn't kill so is this so, foreshadowing they have to battle each other yes. eventually because this Ooh, also that's gonna be fun this also goes into a theory that's being ren was hidden somewhere because that imperial officer that a lot of people suspected if you notice she wasn't on the ship we don't know where she went I didn't see her killed amongst it. She was a big character in a bunch of episodes, and then all of a sudden she disappeared that one. So maybe she was Sabine Wren. Now, in the show, in the show, Sabine and Ezra steal it from Dothamir, where Steal what? The Dark Saber. Where Darth where Maul was holding it. Because Maul technically had it in at the end of the Clone Wars television show and at the end in the beginning of Rebels. They go back and then there is a guy named Viceroy Gar Saxon, who was in charge of Mandalore at the time. So he's basically placed there like just by the Empire, just as a figurehead. Gotcha, gotcha. And Sabine's mom turns on Ezra Sabine and like the other rebels and gives Viceroy Gar Saxon the dark saber. She ends up fighting him using Ezra's new lightsaber, disarms him, and she becomes the wielder of the dark saber. But then she submits it to uh, Bo Katan, who accepts it. Now, a lot of people are saying that doesn't make sense. How come she couldn't accept it from, she could accept it from Sabine, but couldn't accept it from uh, Mando Din. The problem is that maybe she lost it in the first place to uh, Moff Gideon is because she never earned it in the first place. Huh. And that's what people are suspecting. She never earned it, so it was never hers. And that's why Moff Gideon was able to get it. And she realizes that now with Din holding the Darksaber, like, I have to actually earn it this time or else. Like, that's why she wanted to fight Dark Moff Gideon. To begin yeah, with. yeah, yeah. No, I picked up on that. Yeah, I'm kind of lost with all this back and forth. But uh, long story short, Mando has it. Mando has it. Bo-Katan wants it. Bo-Katan wants it. And eventually they're going to have to fight. Yes. And we don't know how she necessarily lost it. So we'll probably see all that in the season three coming yeah, up. Yeah, we'll definitely. Though, I Is think... Bo-Katan getting her own spinoff? I don't think so. Okay, so she'll be back in Mandalorian. And most likely, this is kind of where the story's going. I feel like the story... Remember how season one and most of season two was about Grogu? Yeah. I feel like the story going forward is going to be about the Darksaber. Okay, cool. I think in, in the return of uh, in Mandalore as a planet. So now where does this leave the storylines? Because now that they got Moff Gideon, he wasn't the head honcho here. There's He was working for someone else, right? I don't know. I thought he was the head honcho. Who is that guy, though? You're talking about Thrawn. Grand, Admiral, Thrawn's, Thrawn. Grand, Grand Admiral Thrawn's missing still with Ezra Bridger. Okay. So we don't know where he is. Maybe he is holding the puppet strings behind somewhere else. That's what I'm thinking. But, I mean... Because they're still... not going to capture the bad guy in season two of something. No, no, not at you all. You know what I mean? There's someone else. Maybe the Thrawn scenes. will and, come and back that's... and kill Moff Gideon. And all... Yeah, and also that's also the theme in all of these Star Wars movies is that the guy who you think is the villain is, is not really the not really. There's someone above him yeah. in every one of these. So that's interesting. All right, so that leaves us with how it ends at the, the final uh, end credit scene where that was pretty awesome, uh, right? Actually, I... Okay, there are two things. I know Luke Skywalker coming everyone is excited about. The two things I was more excited about than Luke Skywalker was seeing R2-D2 behind Luke Skywalker. Yeah. That's me, actually. I kind of liked that before more than Skywalker. And also the ending where uh, the end credit scene comes upon Jabba's palace. Yep. And it was cool to see that room again. Yes, the the throne room, and then Jabba's old For this underground crime lord, right? Like, took over after his death. Although people are suspecting how did he survive the barge exploding at the end of Jedi, but whatever. Again, we're talking about a make-believe yeah. show in a make-believe world. 
So we have the throne room, and then Fennec Shand comes down and basically destroys all the guards, yeah. and takes them out, and then Boba Fett, who, by the way, in that in that episode with uh, in that episode with Bill Burr, I loved how they updated his outfit. I thought it was great how we gave it new color. They yeah. kept the dent, like you know, and uh, again, basically- just paying homage to the original, to the original you know? character. And then, um, and then he shoots the guy, throws him off, yeah. and then it ends with the new crime lord sitting on a throne. On the throne, yeah, that was really the cool. New crime lord of the underworld, and how, the that was just that just got my excitement going in all different directions. Like, oh fuck, this uh, next series was it the book of the book of Boba Fett? Boba Fett, yeah, which is going to be its own series because a lot of people were speculating if oh, it was be season is Mandalorian three, no, going to be season be three, cool. book of Boba Fett, but no, book of Boba Fett and the Mandalorian are two different shows. Which exactly? So that leads us into this next conversation of. Wow, we have so much to look forward to in 2020 when it comes to Star Wars. You know, right after our last episode, minutes after our last episode recorded, actually, Disney Plus announced um, a whole bunch of Star Wars and Marvel stuff coming down the pipeline. And I know for Star Wars fans, you got more than you could ever ask for. It seems like almost, (laughs) uh, you know, several times throughout next year, we're going to have a lot of cool Star Wars content as well as Marvel stuff. But let's... Stick with Star Wars real quick. Um, we got a bunch of new shows coming. I know you're really excited about some of these. I'm not really familiar yeah. with a bunch of them, but we let's start off. We do know we got the Book of Boba Fett coming sometime in uh, December 2021. So a little while away, but I'm really excited for that. But another one you said you're super excited Bad for. Batch. Tell me what that's about because no, I have no is, idea. That is animated. Uh, just so people know. The Bad Batch was introduced at the beginning of Season 7 of Clone Wars. Now... Throughout the Clone Wars show, you see that not every clone comes out perfect. Like there are every now and then there are genetic mess ups. Okay. And the Bad Batch is basically about five clones who had special traits. Like you have the brute, you have the shark shooter, you have the tracker, and you have the tech guy. And basically they're an elite. They're basically the A team of the clones. And they were awesome. That to me, that was one of my favorite episodes of season seven. And for them to get their own show. Nice. Now, the trailer that they released, though, makes me wonder, are they going to be an elite force for the Empire? Or are they on their own? Because they have to have chips, but maybe their chips malfunction. The The trailer does hint at Order 66. This happens after Order 66. Okay. So... It makes me wonder. I don't know if they're going to be good guys or bad guys. And or... and I didn't go deep into the animated Clone Wars series, but there were a few of them that got like the chips removed or something, there was right? A bunch that got the so chips removed. there's a possibility, Rex. yeah, that uh, yeah. you know. So that's kind of cool though that we don't know what side they're on right now. Yeah, which and is it, fun. It, it was really interesting. I would definitely recommend people watching it. I know it's animated and there's a lot of people that have the hangups on the animated, but honestly, the animated is just as good and gives so much good backstory to the live action. And like like the show Rebels, there was so much that Mandalorian included in Rebels. Yeah. Like, you know, that and the same thing with Clone Wars. And I think that the Bad Batch bringing them in just is going to be an awesome show. I'm and then excited. we also got, you know, also 2022, a bunch down the pipeline with uh, Ahsoka Tan is going to get Ahsoka, one. I think she's coming out in 2023. Okay. So, Meg, well, in the meanwhile, though, it looks like they're going in a really cool direction. Obi-Wan. The oh, Acolytes, yeah. With all these shows, though, right? The Acolytes, which uh, people are theorizing is about, um, it's supposed to happen at the High Republic. So people are theorizing maybe it's about, about Palpatine. That is about him or at least the Sith leading up to um, the events of episode one and two Um, rogue squadron, which is supposedly going to be about um, like some fighter of like characters that might've been introduced in uh, the Mandalorian. Yeah. I saw that. That was cool. Um, So just, I don't know, a bunch of cool. And here's the thing, like some of them right now I'm saying, I don't know if I have interest in that, but they've, come up with really good ways of making me interested in characters I didn't know about before. And if John Favreau is kind of the, the head of this ship, um, and Dave Finoli and Dave Finoli, uh, is it Finoli? Okay. Finoli. Yeah. Uh, if they're the ones at the head of the ship, uh, it seems like it's going in a really good direction. Um, I, again, going back, I just enjoyed Mandalorian, the story so much better than I did the newest movies that we had, uh, 
The Force Awakens, I thought was really good. Uh, the Last Jedi, I didn't care for at all. And then, um, what was the last one called? Uh, the Rise of Skywalker. Rise of, uh, it was like average for me. You know, um, but this, the whole way felt like a fun ride where by the end, the payoff was great. Like it felt I, like a Star Wars show. Yeah, and I felt like it, my time yeah. wasn't wasted, whereas in the last trilogy we had, you know, it kind of fell flat. It doesn't it doesn't add anything to the lore and to me being a fan. Yeah. This added to me being a fan. Yeah. I mean, we got so much fan service. I got to see inside Slave One. I've always wanted to see that. The seismic charges came back. We got Boba Fett. People have been We got to see stormtroopers, but not just in their blasting, you know, just fighting. Yeah. You got to see them as like normal people or like when um, they won one of the battles, they were like celebrating. They're all hanging um, out. Or you got to yeah. see them just chill and like, yeah, they're eating lunch. So you just got to see like a, they showed us things we were familiar with, but then showed us new sides of things we've never seen before. Something else that they added in here that was really cool, <clears throat> the pirates. Do you remember yeah. the pirates? That What was that in um, Rogue One or no, Solo? They were, were they were they pirates in Solo? They were similar to pirates. So they, were, was, they were marauders. Yeah, it was cool to kind of see that again. You know, the flying pirate ships and these, you know, people trying to uh, get the, what was it, the fuel cell or whatever it was. Aren't they also bringing in some character droid that was like some annoying droid? Oh, Chopper. Okay. From Rebel. Rebel. Isn't he in something coming up? They, they've hinted that he might be in uh, Rogue Squad. Okay. He yeah. might be... Choppers like kind of imagine like um imagine R2D2 with uh Bender's personality. From Futurama. From Futurama. Yeah, no. That's like that's like Chopper. Kind of messing he's kind things of a up. Jerk. He's kind like, of messing yeah, things he's up. A jerk. More, he's more than not, helping sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we got those Star Wars series to look forward to. And we also got a whole bunch of cool Marvel news coming out in 2021. I'm really excited for this. I mean, it almost seems like almost every month we got something new coming out. Uh Starting with WandaVision in just a couple weeks, coming yeah. out uh, January 15th. I'm really excited for this. They've been releasing some more trailers. It looks like every episode is going to be something new. I think by the end of this, we're going to have two new uh, mutants join us. Um, and a Wiccan. concept of what Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness yeah, might be. Exactly. Uh, so what's fun about this is that it, we don't really know what to expect, and it's going to be so out of the box. But I think the payoff at the end is going to be really good. Now, is this going to be like with Mandalorian where every week is a new episode or are they uh, I just think that's, all at once? No, I think it's going to be every week. I think that's it, how they keep their subscribers, you know, yeah. and that's and that's key for them is to keep those subscriber like numbers it. up. What? It made, uh, having a new episode every week, it prevents me from binging it all out at once. I kind of like it. Yeah, it gives you something to look forward to and it kind of yeah. keeps the excitement um, up. Yeah. Each week as each episode goes by. Then moving on, we got uh, the Falcon and Winter Soldier coming in March. So that's pretty cool. A lot of um, things I think are going to come from this. Uh, you know, we're getting Baron Zemo. I think this is going to tie in somehow, some way to Black Widow. There's rumors of it tying into the Thunderbolts and maybe uh, another Hulk movie down the pipeline. So it's really cool how a lot of the TV shows are interacting. Mm -hmm. And then we had that really cool trailer for Loki, which that looks super fun, man. Yeah, I think that's going to be interesting. It looks like he's time traveling. Yes, right? and he was actually caught by the time police. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so... Uh, it's going to be f uh, interesting to see how they maybe tie that into the multiverse or maybe this is just its own thing. It's a different version of yeah. Loki. And then the first movie we're going to get, which <laughs> we've been waiting for this forever. What, two years now? Yeah. Uh, Black Widow in May. Um, at this point, Jesus, just gave it to us. Why do we got to wait that long? I, I mean, They're waiting for theaters is what it is. Yeah, they are waiting for theaters. But I'm, I'm kind of hoping that what Wonder Woman does maybe gives Disney a, an even soul. Gives Disney a little bit of uh, leeway. Maybe they'll do like a dual release. I hope so. And I hope we get it earlier than May 7th, Disney honestly. And... Yeah. And then after that, actually, I'm, I'm looking forward to this one. Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings in July. Now, I don't know too much about it other than the Ten Rings we've seen in Iron Man. One and, and three. And it has to do with the... Uh, Mandarin. The Mandarin, yeah. So hopefully, are we going to see... Uh, how this ties into that character of uh what was the guy's name sir uh who played the 
Oh, the fake man, yeah. um, Ben Ben, ben Kingsley. Kingsley's character. Yeah, I wonder is this going to tie in, and we're going to see uh, what happened with the Ben Kingsley character. You think they're just going to completely retcon this, or, or just ignore that? Maybe this is his own storyline, or I don't know, because Marvel has a great way of taking uh, loose ends that and haven't making been, them work, and, and then tying them up somewhere somewhere down the line. Yeah. So, um, and, and I don't know if you ever seen that uh, short. Uh, it would. I, yeah, it was the one where he's in prison. Where he's in prison, and then like there's they kind of hint that he they, was the Mandarin the own time, right? Or no, they kind of hint that there was a the real Mandarin is mad at him for using his oh, name for using his name and, and yes. his identity, and that we're everywhere and you'll never know where we are, sort of thing. And the guy, I guess, I don't remember what his. I think he was interviewing him, perhaps. I don't remember, but I think inside the camera was a gun. I could have just been making all this stuff, but anyway, it kind of it really led down a cool path where I was like. Okay, I'm kind of, you know, like, let this movie be its own thing. But if it ties in somehow, some way to this Ben Kingsley Mandarin that we had, that would be kind of cool, actually. I'm kind of hoping this is real martial arts movie. Oh, I think like, it ta- I think it totally is. Gonna and be. that that I, I'm always into martial arts films. And I th- I would love to see that. I I kind of. And then I, maybe from there they could jump into uh, maybe an Iron Fist, you know, down the road. You know, a good Iron Fist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not a show that drags on for 12 episodes just for you to see a guy with glowing fist at the 13th. Yeah. Like, you know. Well, another really exciting series, though, that's coming to Disney+. I'm Plus. actually more excited for this than anything else. Yeah. To tell Next you summer, 2021, the What If series. Yeah. And what's so fun about this is you're just seeing, like, these What If scenarios. So what if Peggy Carter got the super serum instead of uh, Steve Rogers and she became Captain Britain? Or uh, what if... Um, uh, Zandu, Zandu, the blue guy from Guardians, I forget his name. What if he came down and, and landed in Wakanda instead of America? And, and, took, and, and Black took T'Challa. Panther, T'Challa and, ended up becoming Star Lord. Yeah. Yeah. That seems really fun That's to me. That's actually awesome. And then there's a bunch of other storylines. The zombies story Yeah, the line. zombies one. And anyway. Uh, I was a big fan of these comics. Yeah. When, and if you notice at the beginning of the trailer, you kind of see the Wanderer in the background. Yep. And I'm I'm happy that he's going to be like the, the time, narrator or something. The narrator, yeah. kind of like the crypt keeper, but not you know nice. tales from the crypt. So that's going to be really fun. Yeah. And again, um, there's a bunch of these episodes, and I only know about a handful, so I'm kind of really curious about what these other half of the season is going to be. Well, there's a whole series of comics that they could go into, and now if they're basing it on the television show, or the movies and television shows, they can even explore further. Yeah. So that's going to be really exciting. And then finally, toward the end of the year, we're going to be getting the Eternals movie. And we talked about this a little bit in previous episodes. I know Ben, you're really excited about this. I'm excited for this. Now that I'm seeing that it's coming in November, it kind of is making me nostalgic. So December is always a time I love going to the movies. Like, you know, as someone who doesn't really celebrate Christmas, I used to always do movies and, and Chinese food. Like in the past, and I would go see the newest Star Wars or comic book movie. Now I do celebrate Christmas, so like, you know, I don't really get to do that. But during the November, December time, I do love going to the movies and it's nostalgic uh, for sure. Yes, and seeing that that's going to be released at the beginning of November kind of makes me excited for next year. Hopefully, well, this should will make you even more movie. excited because in December we're getting Spider Man 3. Yes, so there you go, and it's right around Christmas time, as a matter of fact. So yeah. I hope it doesn't get pushed back because. You know, this kind of slate of all the Marvel stuff coming out is really exciting. And to kind of cap off the year with um, maybe a Spider-Man film would be awesome. Uh, We talked in depth about that in the last episode. So if you haven't heard it, go back and check all that out. Bunch of theories and and who we think the villains are going to be and where they're going with it. John says how his favorite Spider-Man is Andrew Garfield. So make sure you comment hate underneath in the comment section against him about how disgusting he is. um, (laughs) My tag is at Pumpkin Claw. Thank you. Uh, Nice. Uh, All right. And then sometime also at the end of the year, we're going to get Miss Marvel, which is different than Captain Marvel, which I just made that mistake. But uh, yeah, we're getting a Miss Marvel series. Uh, I don't really care for this, but we'll see where they land. I'm surprised they're investing a series into her, considering that people were so negative on her in the video game. I was about to say, they invest a lot of time into this character, and I I, I see more like dislike for this character. For this than, character than, than they like it. Yeah. Some of the complaints are very just stupid, though, I will admit. But also, I know in the vi- the people hated the video game. 
Uh, there were apparently a lot of things wrong with the video game. The gameplay was not great. Uh, they said the storyline felt rushed. Um, and the Miss Marvel character, and it wasn't necessarily her character in general. It was how she progressed. They yeah. didn't like... And I understand what they were trying to do. They were trying to create an outsider that you played that got injected into the Avengers. And that's who they used. But, you know, maybe they should just let you play as an Avenger. The game's yeah. called Avengers. Yeah. Let you play as an Avenger. I like, kind of wanted to just be Iron Man or Captain America. Yeah. Or yeah, the Hulk. Exactly. You, know? you didn't have was. to have, like, an ever, anybody, like, you know, be put in there. But we'll see. You could have just had a game where you're one of the Avengers and you're fighting the villains from the movies and people would have liked it. Every chapter you play a different adventure story. Like, Anything. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and then also at some point next year, we're also getting the Hawkeye series. And again, we talked in depth about that last episode. So go back and check that out. But I'm excited for this one. I think it's going to be good. I think it's going to lead into some other uh, cool storylines down the road. Uh, maybe Young Avengers eventually. And we're getting introduced to some new characters in that series. So I think it's going to be pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. All right, wrapping things up here. Let's talk about the DC lineup for 2021. Um, basically, we got one confirmed and a bunch of TBAs to be announced. So we got The Suicide Squad. I'm excited about this. James, James Gunn. We got a whole cast of characters, um, some celebrities in here. A lot of people, I think, are just going to get you know knocked off in funny and cool ways. Uh, I can't imagine this is going to be worse than the first movie we got well, james so, gunn has put out some great yeah movies, all the guardians so, i enjoy yeah. so, so i mean if he can if he can just be at par with that it's not we're only for the guardians good. i mean you said you loved brightburn and he executive oh, yeah. produced that yeah exactly um he's done a couple other darker things that so i think a a movie about a bunch of villains who are supposed to die is a perfect avenue for him and then what are the, some of the TBAs we got coming down the road? Uh, for television shows, we got Peacemaker, Green Lantern, Gotham City Police, DC Superheroes. That sounds like a Washington football team. <laughs> Might be an animated um, Justice League Dark. That's actually interesting. I'm glad they're... I'm kind of is hoping animated that's animated. That? Okay. I'm kind of hoping it's animated. I mean, they could do live action. Maybe they'll bring the original Constantine back from that television show. And He's think, made an appearance in some of the crossovers, actually. Yeah, so maybe they'll bring some villains and stuff, uh, some characters back from the shows. Bizarro TV. Okay. I don't know anything about any of these. Bizarro, but well, you know, I know Bizarro. Bizarro. Yeah, Bizarro like, Superman. So Bizarro TV. Maybe, does he, are they giving him his own talk show? <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Have Superman on as a guest? Um, Wonder Girl, which we talked about yeah. and uh, we glossed over in our last episode, and Naomi. What is Naomi? Uh, I moan backwards. <laughs> well, anyway, I don't, I don't really know much about any of these. Sh these, I mean, obviously, I know Green Lantern. I know Peacemaker is going to be John Cena. Uh, let's see. I mean, I I don't know. Are these Gotham City Police? I heard is going to be year one compared to the Batman movie. So where are these going to be on? Are these CW? Are these I think it's a mixture HBO Max? Of, uh, a mixture of HBO Max and also the uh, DC streaming service. Because I can't but didn't see DC it. streaming service like end and, and now it's just HBO Max? Or am I wrong with that? Oh, I don't know. I thought that you could still subscribe to it because that's yeah. where you see Swamp Thing and all of them. No, but now they got Swamp Thing on Hulu? I think it is. Oh, yes. Swamp Thing is on Hulu. Yeah. So anyway, I don't know. A bunch of platforms out there. A bunch of these shows are coming out. I don't know. Look it up yourself, guys. Okay, Ben. So we got a lot to look forward to in the next year. I know we both are hoping going into 2021, things are going to be much better than this dreadful 2020 that we had. Uh, for me, I know it's all about Disney Plus, uh, the Marvel and Star Wars stuff coming out. Maybe DC will surprise us. Um, we'll see what happens with that. There's a lot of content. Yeah. But let's wrap up this episode. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to us on YouTube, as well as Apple Podcast and Spotify. Please rate and review, and even leave a comment if you feel so inclined. You can also follow us on IG at Infinite Universe Podcast or on Twitter at Infinite Unipod. All right, our friends, that's it for today's episode. And remember, although we may be a holes, we are not 100% dicks. Until next time, I'm Jay Days. I'm Ben. And we're out of here. Peace. Peace.